Granny Green Socks, flying backwards through a world of delusion towards truth. Hello, here I am still alive after all these years. I am 72 today and it's a reason for some astonishment to me. I've been working more in the last few years towards maintaining optimum health because the more old age beckons, the more you start to think, well, I don't want to be old and completely wrecked. I want to be fit enough to enjoy it, if that's what's going to happen. So we survived COVID. I think that was a big scare story. I know people died, but I think the way all the governments in the world tackled it, with the exception of Sweden possibly, was just panicky and a kind of follow my leader, blind um, throw in the kitchen sink at something that really could have done with a bit more forethought and a bit more listening to actual scientists. But anyway, here we are. And I even went along with the vaccination thing. I got the first dose and I got the second dose and I thought, oh good, well, this is all hunky-dory. The government succeeded. We've got our shots and now we are going to help the world not to die of some awful disease. And lo and behold, something like four months later, we got COVID <laughs> and we didn't die. We were quite ill for, I should say, four days, fever, bed rest. Um, it didn't seem to go to our lungs too much. And it took about three weeks to recover from. And guess what? About three weeks ago, I got COVID again. Now, I did have the first booster, which happened towards Christmas after I got my first COVID. And I, it, I was in two minds. I was thinking, why should I need a booster if I've already had the disease? Surely that should protect me as much as anything will. But our government was so insistent. Oh, it will do some good. It will protect the population. It's safe and effective and all that guff. So I took it. And after that, I started to think, is this going to go on forever? Are they going to push these boosters on us every six months indefinitely? This is going to cost a fortune. This is our taxpayer money, right? And the more you look at what people are saying in the media, the more you realise there was actually no honest proof that either it was safe or it was effective. And all the stories came out about how it was um, damaging a small but significant proportion of the vaccinated population. They were getting serious things, myocardia, heart attacks, death. And then it emerged that people who had died and who went to the undertakers and the, the relatives were asking that they be embalmed, it was discovered that their arteries and veins were blocked with great long clots of an undetermined nature. And this was happening to vaccinated people. They were dying suddenly and they were full of these strange clots. And there are all sorts of other effects which the rest of us are probably getting but don't quite realise what it is. And you have to wonder, was it all worth it now that we're in debt up to our eyeballs and beyond and our government is now going to force us to live in a very um, austere way without saying the word austerity but they're cutting back they're, they're not cutting back on their grandiose plans for giving money to the rest of the world and giving money to non-governmental organizations and charities and things that are pushing some kind of agenda that they think is worth pushing which is a total useless waste of money when we could live without it and we haven't really got the money to pay for it you know, when I was young, it was all, don't get into debt. You have to always be able to pay your debts. If that works on an individual level, why doesn't it work on a governmental level? Anyway, so here I am thinking everything is not what I thought it was. The world is turned upside down. You listen to different people. They give different perspectives on things. And maybe the only person I can really rely on is myself and what I can discover. So for a few years, I've been randomly checking my blood pressure, which before all the COVID nonsense, 
was fairly regularly 120 over 70. And I was thinking, good, my blood pressure's normal. Nothing will happen to me. But over the years since, it's gradually gone up. And after the last infection, I tested, tested it and it was the highest it's ever been. I'll tell you what it was. 2.45 in the morning, it was 178 over 107, which was pretty scary. So hubby's trying to tell me I should go to the doctor and I should get it sorted the way doctors are supposed to. Well, I no longer believe that doctors can sort things and particularly in, in the UK, the health service is quite evidently broken. You know, you, you can register with a doctor and then when you phone to make an appointment, you get told, no, you have to phone at 8.30 in the morning and wait in a queue. And if you wait in the queue at 8.30 in the morning, you'll be lucky if you get someone answering it and offering you a slot. But normally what they'll do is they'll answer the phone and they'll say, what's your problem? So the receptionists, not the actual doctor, want to know what your problem is and to tell you what you should do about it, which is, it makes me quite indignant. I phoned them a few years ago when I had a strange sort of puffiness in my eye. I had been on the allotment, I had kind of, I had an itch in my eye so I rubbed it with the back of my hand and probably my sleeve as well. I got a sharp kind of sensation as though something was pricking my skin and then later on it started to puff up and it was puffing up and puffing up and my whole eye was swollen and I was thinking my goodness, what if I've got a blood infection? I don't want that to take hold. And the reason I phoned the doctor was I wanted to see the doctor and ask if I could have antibiotics. Well, antibiotics is a whole other issue and we shouldn't really be too reliant on them. But anyway, I was, my mother had had a, an infection from a, a scratch on her arm one time from gardening and her arm had started to swell up and, you know, blood poisoning. She had to go to the doctor and get into antibiotics and it was pretty scary for a while, so I thought, right, I'll preempt that. But anyway, the receptionist who answered the phone wouldn't give me an appointment with a doctor. She kept insisting that I had to go to Boots the Chemist in town. And I said, but why? I, I phoned because I want to see a doctor. I don't want to go to the chemist. <laughs> and she said, but that's where you go for eye problems now. And I said, what? When did that happen? Last thing I knew, you went to doctors for medical problems. And I insisted and insisted. And she eventually gave me an appointment, not with a doctor, but with a locum, a paramedic. And the paramedic hummed and hard and gave me the antibiotic I'd asked for. And I said, well, what's all this about being redirected to Boots the Chemist? Is, is this a normal thing now in the NHS? And he said, well, yes, we, we outsource it now. There's, there's an eye doctor at the chemist, and that's what you do. Oh? So, well, I never understood that, and in theory it sounds like a good idea, but it was kind of sneaky that they did that. So I didn't get to see the, the chemist doctor, and I don't know how good they are, or I don't even know whether they're part of an American company. You know, there's this suspicion that we're being taken over by the Americans all the time, but be that as it may. So I took my antibiotics, which in retrospect was probably unnecessary and a mistake, but you expect to be able to talk to a medically trained person and have an informed opinion and be able to make choices, and that just doesn't happen anymore. So when I discovered that my blood pressure had been getting steadily higher and by the look of it, it wasn't actually going to go down of its own accord. I started to think maybe I should go to the doctor. And then I thought, well, sod it. The doctor's only going to prescribe um, some kind of blood pressure medication. There's going to be no investigation. They haven't got the money. They haven't got the time. The doctor will just say, all right, I'll, I'll prescribe this one. And you have to take it however much, twice a day or something, for the rest of your life because that's what my mother had to do. She went to hospital with a stroke in her 80s and um, she was just prescribed blood, I, blood pressure medication. And she was supposed to take it every day for the rest of her life. Nobody ever checked what effect it was having. 
whether the dose was right, whether she still had high blood pressure, they just, you know, she went into the care home and they were very insistent, oh, we must have all her prescriptions and we must give them to her religiously. And I'm thinking, is this really a good medical model to follow? Surely the individual ought to have more knowledge and more responsibility and the doctor should actually be there to check on things and give advice and they're not doing that at all. So I'm thinking, is it really just going to get worse? Am I going to get very high blood pressure? What would the result of that be? So I looked online, went to my favourite resource, YouTube, and listened to various people talking about high blood pressure. And yes, it's bad. If you have persistent high blood pressure, you get organ damage, kidney failure, your brain stops working properly. That's the thing that probably bothers people most as they get older is loss of brain function. And I really want to avoid becoming a living vegetable, being fed junk food in some care home and watching television all day. But I really don't have faith in the National Health Service any longer. And I really want to know more about high blood pressure. What causes it? You know, if I went to the doctor, the doctor would not initiate any tests to show how my arteries are blocked, why they're blocked. Are they getting rigid with age? Is that all it is? Is it tension? Or is, is there something actually building up inside them? I'd like to know these things. I've been working on my diet and changing my diet fairly frequently with each new piece of information I get, and I'll tell you about that another time. Uh, if I'm told a particular diet, I want to know why and how it's going to work. So apparently salt is bad. But how can salt be bad? Because everybody consumes salt and normally it's not a problem. So what makes it a problem for people with high blood pressure? Don't know. And low potassium, on the other hand, is an indication that you're not dealing with your salt properly because you need potassium to balance out the salt or something. But I checked and my diet includes a lot of potassium rich foods, so that shouldn't be an issue. Then there's overweight. People are obsessed with weight nowadays. I'm not entirely convinced that it's all about weight. I think it's about metabolic health. See, as an old person, if you just focus on weight, as, you're, as you lose bone mass, you're going to get lighter, aren't you? But you're not necessarily losing the fat. So I think that's a, a false approach. I think you have to look at it as metabolic health. And that depends on what you eat and what you exclude from your diet. And that's an issue for another day as well, really. But I am satisfied that I am not overweight. I'm perfect, perfect in my size. You can see my ribs, look. So that's fine. Then there's alcohol consumption. Well, I do drink a bit of alcohol, maybe two glasses of wine a week, maybe three, possibly. I don't know if that's excessive. I can't see that it would be a factor. And there's smoking. Well, I don't smoke. I've never smoked, so that also is not a factor. Then there's sleep apnea. If you stress the brain, that might cause high blood pressure. And high blood pressure, in its turn, affects the brain and prevents blood flow. So you want to make sure your brain gets enough blood, obviously. Another thing is diet. A lot of people say you mustn't eat red meat because that is associated with raised blood pressure. Well, is it? Is it really? I've been listening to so many people who have moved to a diet of red meat only the carnivore diet, they call it, and it doesn't seem to affect their blood pressure. And dietary advice is all so mixed up and confused nowadays because of so many studies and agendas that have been all jumbled together. And one so-called expert says something and everybody else parrots it and you don't know what to believe. So it is true that for the last few months I have been eating an increased amount of meat and particularly of red meat and of meat fat, animal fat. And I'm, 
I mean, there would be an easy way to test this on a kind of anecdotal one, one person experimental level. I could stop eating meat and stop eating meat fat for maybe a month and see if that had an effect on my blood pressure. I could try that, but I'm going to start with something else. I'm going to start with exercise. Now, exercise is a thing that it's easy to let slip. Since we retired from the book business, I admit I have been spending a lot more time on the internet. And being on the internet, what does this involve? It involves sitting, being sedentary, stationary, not moving except possibly now and again to heave yourself out of your seat and plod off to the kitchen to get a cup of tea or something. But not exercise. And I suspect that sitting still in front of the screen can be quite a large factor in why my blood pressure is going up. I mean, I also check whether COVID sends up your blood pressure, and there have been studies to show that it does, but only by a little bit, not by as much as I'm getting. So I'm going to go with the exercise theory for the moment. So you're meant to have, I think, 150 hours of aerobic exercise a week, which works out at 20 minutes a day and 10 minutes extra on Sundays or something. I can't jog because I have a dodgy hip and a dodgy ankle arthritis. So I can walk, but I have been walking and that has apparently not affected the blood pressure. You know, a couple of times a week I might walk a couple of miles. I walk to the shops, I walk to the allotment. I also do a bit of digging, although obviously not every day. But this amount of exercise I'm getting clearly is not hitting the spot. I have a rowing machine. I hate this rowing machine with a passion. It's so bloody boring and it's painful. It makes my arms ache. I don't understand how anyone can enjoy that kind of exercise, but it's the kind of exercise I've got. It doesn't hurt my ankle or my hips, so I need to go with it. So what I'm doing is starting a new regime of determinedly exercising on the rowing machine every day for at least 20 minutes. And in a week or so, I'll see what effect that has. So, let you know. See you later. Bye.